Praise the Lord, everybody. This is Pastor Max, the senior pastor of the East Friendship Baptist Church here in Northeast Washington, D.C. Uh, I want to invite you to listen to this message um, that we actually preach today entitled The uh, Cradle and the Cross, a message to the black man and a message to America. Um, Joe Gregory, Dr. Joe Gregory, the preaching professor at, down in Baylor, one of, I think, the greatest preachers in America, uh, outside of Gardner Taylor and a few others, um, preached a sermon years ago called The Cradle and the Cross. And I used uh, pieces of his sermon as a homiletical jump into some of the issues going on in America today, particularly as it relates to the shooting of unarmed black men throughout the four corners of America. And there are so many uh, parents and communities that are hurting from what's going on. And we really believe that in order to make a difference, we're going to have to approach this situation a little bit differently. And so in the sermon, I'm literally asking uh, Al Sharpton and all of our leaders in America to go beyond the march on December 13th uh, and literally reverse the 13th to 31st and from the 13th of December to the 31st of December that we actually black out economically some of the areas of our country asking all the NBA players, all the NFL players, entertainers, leaders, uh, commentators, new person, preachers, pastors, everyone, that we literally communicate to America that black life truly matters. We know that Christ died for all men. He, he would that all men be saved. Uh, and so he never you know, marginalized any people. But here in America, historically, uh, well over the 400 years of chattel slavery and the years that we been here in this journey facing Jim Crow, we've been still in the same fight. And it's shocking that 2014, we're going through what we're going through. So I want you to come in and listen to this word. I think it's a word that uh, is necessary for such a time as this. And I believe it's a call to a new level of action. And so be praying for you know all of our leaders that are working to try to bring a peaceful solution that's what we want is peace, and we want to reflect our king and his kingdom. We want to do it peacefully and honorably and allow the love of Christ to go forth. But in the African-American church, we know that we have to have a black hermeneutic that some people can't handle. And we remember how people executed Jeremiah Wright for black theology. But in the context of the inner city and the neighborhoods that we are in, the urban spaces we're in, it requires that we sound the trumpet of Zion in a very profound, uh, direct way. Uh, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. And so come and preach, hear the sermon, listen to it, enjoy it. And so we're so grateful just to be part of the journey. God bless you. I'll be reading from the rustic language of the King James. And it reads thusly, Now Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. In the days of Herod the king, behold, King wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east have come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes, the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. They said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, but thus it is written by the prophet, Thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, but out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently, What time the star appeared? And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. And when they had heard the king, they departed. Lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them to the king and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced in exceedingly great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, fell down and worshipped him. When they opened their treasures, they presented him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. 
and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. The word of God for the people of God. Blessed be the name of our God. We will see it in the presence of the Lord. In light of all the things that are going on in our country, I want to preach this message, the cradle and the cross, a message to black men and America. The cradle and the cross, a message to black men and America. Pray with me and stay with me. From the time we arrived in chains on the Virginia shores, on a slave ship in 1619. Some say a slave ship named Jesus. We have been a people forced to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. Do I have a witness? Our ancestors' blood still tints the Atlantic after being forced into the narrow halls of ship. But yet they protested through insurrections and even death as they were being transported like cattle and commodities to a new land called America. They had a dream of greatness, but lacked the heart to match. We endured 400 years of chattel slavery, one of the most wicked or compassionate forms of oppression since the Hebrew slaves endured slavery in Egypt. And only comparable to the suffering and death of untold millions of Jewish brothers and sisters at Auschwitz. Over those 400 dark years, America raped continuously our women, ripped apart our families, killed without reason or cause our sons and daughters. They hung, beat, lynched, castrated, neutered, executed, and spilled blood from black bodies on the hollow grounds of southern and northern states without blinking. But yet, of a better America, while the seams of the fabric of our nation were being pulled north and south during the Civil War, and in the shadows of the Emancipation Proclamation and the urging of great leaders like Frederick Douglass, 179,000 black men joined the Union Army and enlisted, and 7,122 black officers also joined, all representing 10% of the Union Army. And don't get it twisted. They came to fight and die. Two of them were Frederick Douglass' own son. 40,000 of them did die over the course of that war. And some of you may even recall the infantry who fought gallantly at Milken's Bend in LA, in Port L uh, Hudson, Louisiana, in Petersburg, Virginia, in Nashville, Tennessee, just to name a few. But I believe that every one of you have seen that movie, Glory. Yes. Yes. It recalled the July 1863 assault on Fort Wagner, South Carolina, in which the 54th Regiment of Massachusetts volunteers, all black regiment that is, lost two thirds of their officers and half their troops, as Denzel portrayed uh, in that film. And so we have to be clear that black men and women's blood was spilled to bring the Confederate Army to its knees and to offer America a hopeful future. Amen. But the truth be told, there was no war fought by or within the United States in which black Americans did not participate, including the Revolutionary War, the, the, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, the World Wars, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, and even wars without causes unjust wars due to revenge and the oil in Iraq and the war, war in Afghanistan and the war on terrorism and many small conflicts in Grenada and Panama, we were there yes, shedding our blood. Yeah. And so let me say it another way so you get it in your spirit. Across the long arc of American history, three moments in particular have disproportionately determined the course of this republic called America and its development. Each respectively distill the experience and define the historical le legacy of the century. Each embraced a pair of episodes with lasting transformative impact. 
And so from 1776 to 1789, the Revolutionary War and the adoption of the Constitution brought national independence and established the basic political framework uh, with, within this nation that we are governed in at this time. And then from 1861, to 1877, the Civil War and Reconstruction affirmed the integrity of the Union, ended slavery, Lord have mercy, and generated three constitutional amendments that at least laid the foundation for honoring the Declaration's promise that all men are created equal. Everybody hear me. And between 1929 and 1945, the Great Depression and World War II utterly redefined the role of government in American society and, and capitulated the United States from an isolated peripheral state into a world superpower. And so this red, white, and blue flag that we uh, celebrate all the time, that red signifying the blood of America, but that red also signifies black blood, blood that came from black bodies that was spilled defending and building the constitution of the nation. And still, after all the blood we shed, there's still no respect, still no justice, uh, still uh, no righteous laws here at home. And, and we have to deal continuously with the lawlessness within the justice system of this great nation called America. And so our service, our sacrifice uh, is still not enough for some. Uh, right now, while black fathers are serving in the military overseas, doing nation building and nation rebuilding and protecting the oil fields of Iraq and security in Afghanistan, white police officers who should be protecting us are shooting down our unarmed sons in the streets across America. And over history, and even most recently, America has bombed and destroyed entire nations that spent billions and even a trillion dollars to rebuild them, but you still have a problem cashing the American black man's check in the bank of humanity. Still a problem. You can build all that you build overseas, and you still have a, a problem cashing our check in the bank of humanity. And so you still have a problem providing fair uh, health care system that would include us and many more poor whites. You still have a problem investing in jobs and training in the inner cities and expanding entrepreneurship to the to the left to the left out and a put out. But yet you bail out greedy banks with their deceptive and manipulative practices, breaking the backs of, uh, of poor, the poor in the nation and the blacks in the nation. You bailed out insurance companies and security companies that provide no assurance to us and no security within the borders, but expect you and I to protect the borders from people who look just like us. And so if you study the depths of American history and you climb uh, deep in the bowels of American history, uh, you would see recorded in this history a three-fifth compromise. It was a negotiation that occurred between the North and South states in ancient days around the Civil War that carried the tone and made clear the value of black free and black enslaved humans uh, who was, who was uh, literally told that we were only worth three-fifths of a human being. Three-fifths humans, and, and that spirit systematically reduces us and declares us less than human, and many people today still believe that. There are many in America who perpetuate this dark lie and still cast a shadow over the, the same system of America. And that's why it's so easy to take a black professional football player and jail him for, for, for dog fighting him. And that's why it's easy to take a, a, a teenage boy most recently who, who shot a police dog uh, because he didn't know the dog was a police dog, but he, he shot the police dog and now they gave him 23 years in prison for killing that dog. And at the same time, we can release white policemen over and over again, and we can release wannabe cops like Zimmerman for gunning down unarmed black men on the cold concrete street of urban spaces. Why are you here to be today? And the reason this is going on because America, so many in America, still devalues black life. But we are on assignment today, and I, I believe you're with me because we're here to tell America that black life matters. So America would have never had an industrial revolution, would have never had a future, a fruitful future, would have never had become an economic power or world military power. 
if black hands, bodies, souls, and blood were not used as the fuel yes. to develop the infrastructure and foundation of this nation, enabling, enabling them to realize such power. And so I don't know about you. I got a little bit of fire in my spirit right now. But I don't know about you. We have waited patiently for justice to roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. But we almost drowned down by the riverside where we had to run away to flee from slavery or fight for freedom through insurrection. We almost drowned in the water hoses of Bull Connors and George Wallace. We almost drowned in Katrina but because of Bush negligence and ignorance. We almost drowned in subprime loans called ghetto loans by Wells Fargo and other banks who shape deceptive practices and deals for black clients that they call mud people. That's what they have written down. Bank loans for the mud people who pay extraordinary interest for homes that they did not really own who wiped out 47.6 of black wealth. Even today, that black wealth is hard to restore. And now we're drowning again. Can't you hear uh, and feel it coming up to your neck? Or maybe just me moving my neck. I feel like there's a drowning going on, but this time we're drowning in the blood of unarmed sons and daughters who are being gunned and down in the streets of America. Gunned down, some of them because they're black and they're proud. Gunned down because of threat to power and white male anger because a black man is in the presidency. Gun down because there's a new clan, KKK, who has permeated the law enforcement in order to eliminate black men. Gun down because of the loss of political power due to the black and browning of America. And they know soon by 2056, uh, there'll be a majority of colored people in this nation. And so they're mad at it and they're gunning us down. Uh, and the fact of the matter, uh, don't get it twisted, 2006 to 2012, a white police officer killed a black unarmed person at least twice a week. Twice a week, and it's still going on. And I don't know about you, but I believe we struggled too hard, cried too long, bled too much, walked too many protests about to allow us to continue in 2014. I'm here because I too believe in the dream of a bright day of peace and brotherhood 
with a historical creed of our founding fathers will be fulfilled and one day we'll live out the truth that all men are created equal, that we all are endowed by our creator with a certain unalienable rights that among them is life, the right to live, the right to live, the right to live, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. But let's talk real, can we be real? That day has not come. But the days of protesting and marching for a few days and going back to business as usual, that's over. You and I can't continue to do that. Make a lot of noise and go back to doing the same foolishness we've been doing. Those days are over. No, if you don't know it or not, America is addicted to power. We love and we are addicted to power. Those who wield it and are privileged to have it often abuse it. We are asked to trust the majority and those in power to be righteous and just, equitable and fair, merciful and magnanimous. We who have been asked to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. We are still afflicted, often marginalized, murdered, maligned, and cast as a menace to society. We are not suffering from amnesia. I don't have amnesia. Do you have? I, I, know, I remember our history. We see the blood in the streets. We remember the blood of our ancestors spilled in the hulls of ship, dripping from a southern noose, running from thorny cotton, leaking from the master's whip, coloring from the cop's billy club, filling the drains of urban streets, and screaming for justice. And there is a message for those who in America abuse their power, those who oppress the masses. The message is the cradle and the cross are saying, your five minutes are up. That's what I'm here to tell you. The cradle and the cross says you have your five minutes and your throne is coming down. Can I preach it the way I'm feeling it? Oh, and that's what Advent, the word Advent means coming. Uh, here, housed in Matthew chapter 2, it exclaims loudly that their throne is coming down. It points us to the cradle and the cross of Christ which Dr. Joel C. Gregory, a talented preacher and professor of preaching at George W. Truett Theological Seminary in Baylor University says, witness through the cross, or the cradle and the cross, the timeless, chainless reaction to the impotent infant and the prostrate, pathetic savior who was dying on the cross. They both were at their weakest place. Lord, have mercy. These are two pictures of Christ in the cradle uh, and on the cross marks two self-evident and manifest points of our Lord's greatest weakness. Stay with me now, because I'm going down a street that you're going to understand in a minute. We witness the wonder of the weakness of God in the, these two great Christian holy days uh, where we celebrate Christmas as well as Easter. We know Christ grew into full power in his ripened manhood at the age of 33 and literally was at the zenith or the height uh, of power and then he jested in uh, all that on the cross and once again on the cross we see him vulnerable and weak uh, as the infant that was in the cradle uh, but he, he's vulnerable yet he's strong. <laughs> the cradle and the cross tells us that our God intends to use the weak things of the world the foolish things to put shame that which man calls strong and wise. The weakest things of God is better than all the strongest things of man. They can bring out tanks uh, our police department can bring tanks and uh, men mounted with uh, M16s and machine guns, uh, but all the power, all the uh, all the military might they can bring in our communities will never even compare to our God at His weakest point. In the cradle and in the cross, do I have a witness? And so the weakest things of God is better than the strongest things of man. And so today, so all those in power and all those who use their power for oppression. I want you to bear witness to the weakness of God on the cradle and on the cross. Don't you recall that Luke version of the advent and life of Christ reminds us that the cradle of Christ grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and with man, and then a voice from heaven came down and said, this is my beloved son. He got the father ratified and confirmed who he was. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And so great crowds followed him and could not be kept away by distance nor darkness. 
And so the cradle of Christ became the Christ on the cross. And his strength became paralyzed, a, a paralyzed, prostrate man on the cross. And so we see his wisdom, uh, his growth in wisdom with God appeared to be canceled at the foolishness of the cross. We see his growth in stature seemed to be called into question uh, with the, the desertion of his disciples and God's desertion of, the, of Christ on the cross. His favor with man appeared to be canceled by the shivering shame on the cross. Uh, but I know uh, he may have looked weak, uh, but he's strong. He even promises you while you are weak, and in your weakness, he will strengthen you. And so I remember the majestic, mature, manly Messiah who taught, who healed, who prophesied, who put on display strength never seen before. Don't you remember him rebuking uh, the wind, saying, peace, be still. Uh, not only did the wind be still, but the devil that was behind the wind. And so he raised the dead and called legions and called them to go into pigs. Yeah. Uh, the mature, manly Christ yeah. uh, made a crippled man walk and a blind man see yeah. and a mute man talk. And you know how I say, and the deaf ear, you and me. Yeah. A mature Christ. Uh, he put his hand uh, on funeral processions and they turned into parades. Yeah. Uh, a mature Christ. Uh, uh, spoke life and, and literally laid hands on blind by the maze, uh, and he got sight, uh, made nine lepers to be healed, and only one came back to say thank you. Uh, a mature Christ. Uh, a woman had an issue of blood for 12 years, uh, and she took, took, took a little piece of his garment, and virtue came out of his garment. A mature Christ. I'm talking about power. A mature Christ. But never in all Maturity and his manhood did the magi's march from the mysterious east, or did a star come and stand over where he was? Why he was mature, you saw no star, you saw no magi. It was in the wonder of the weakness of the cradle of Christ that the magi's march from the east and bow, as the text says, at the child in the manger with his mother Mary. Uh, it was a star in Heaven that haunted the haughty Herod, the Pharaoh of his time, the King of Jerusalem, and the infinite power of the infinite Savior is a thing for Advent and Christmas meditation. Uh, so we see this infant Christ, everybody coming, even at his vulnerability, even at his weakness, bowing down because they knew he was King of kings and Lord of lords. But before his lips ever framed the word, before his hands ever worked a miracle, Lee, before he ever uh, promulgated a doctrine, before his feet ever walked across the chaos of the sea, before his mind ever interpreted the thoughts uh, and the wicked intentions of his enemies, uh, there was a disruption uh, in the heavens. The stars shifted in order. Angelic choirs changed their selection. A shaking and disruption in the earth and the powerful kingdom of Herod and Rome, as the text says, at the arrival of the cradle of Christ, troubled the king. A child had the king tripping. A child. And all Jerusalem with him, the Bible says. Shepherds came leaping over fences. Mysterious kings came marching around. Uh, the city uh, ordered and flustered, and the cradle of Christ never even spoke a word or lifted his finger. This child, the cradle of Christ, and the, and the Christ on the cross, although weak, uh, they, 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 they dealing with a Christ at his weakness, and they can't deal with him. What you going to do on the second time? What you going to do when Christ comes back a second time with justice in his hand, judgment in his hand? What you going to do when he has his sword in his hand, and he's coming back to let the poor uh, and those in the margins to be made great? Uh, those who are last will be first. And so America, if you don't realize you've been dealing with a weak Christ in a cradle. You've been dealing with a weak Christ on the cross. But when he comes back, judgment and righteousness and justice will roll down like water. And there's going to be a change. And you're going to have to deal with another kind of Jesus. I don't think you're ready for this Jesus. Uh, you can know that a man be panty nicer. I uh, praise the Lord a Jesus, but a Jesus with a sword, and he's going to come and deal with all the unrighteous. He's going to come and deal with all the oppressors. He's going to come to deal with those who take from the poor, who don't have a heart for God. He's going to change all things around. 
happy God. Yes. And so the cradle of Christ, the cross bearing Christ, although weakly, has more power than all mankind. The power of the pharaohs, the heritage of the world, can't handle the cradle of Christ nor the Christ on the cross in his greatest weakness, and they still never will be able to handle the cross that's coming back. The question is, can you handle that cross? Yes. Can you handle that Christ yes. who no longer in the cradle, or Christ no longer in the cross, who's coming church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Oh, I can't preach it the way I'm feeling it. He's coming back for justice. All those courts, all those kangaroo juries, all those kangaroo grand juries, uh, he's going to shake that all up. Uh, all those people uh, like that one in Mike Brown's case, uh, that prosecutor who took an old law He knew prior to 1985, you were able to shoot a fleeing person who, who, who you were chasing as a cop. You could shoot him down. But that law changed nationally in 1985. But the prosecutor in the Mike Brown case took that law, copied it, and gave it to every one of the jurors and asked them to consider this as you are making your decision. That's why Mike Brown and his family never had an opportunity to get an indictment, nor that he can find that policeman guilty, Darren Wilson, and his crazy how do you look himself. <laughs> they didn't have a chance. It always was fixed. The jury was fixed. And you wonder why we're getting crazy and we're tired of being just like you wonder why we marching in the streets. You wonder why we burn the place down. Oh! 
You cannot be empty stomach if you want. And you can keep turning your head that police keep shooting the unarmed boys and girls in the streets. And don't even bring them to a trial. I don't understand it. And the case of Eric Gardner, you had my Lord Jesus. Oh, oh my God. Black and brown people, but rarely ever frisk anybody who's not black and brown. 
No longer will we allow toy cops like Zimmerman with his own agenda to police our neighborhoods or even come in the hood. He ain't allowed there. No longer are we going to allow them to shoot down our children. And so, remember, every time Christ was in the cradle, they came with frankincense and myrrh and their treasures that they presented themselves as a sacrifice. Even at the cross, Josephus gave his tomb up. Uh, you can't be close to the cradle and the cross and not take action and present something as a sacrifice. Yeah, and so if we're really talking and ready to walk what we're talking now, then we got to change what we're doing. We need a boycott. And we need to black out America. I know that my beloved brother Al Sharpton and the leaders of the National Aid Action Network have called for a national march on 13th December. Uh -huh. But I want to also add something to it. Yeah. Take the 13th uh -huh. and spin it around. Yeah. And from the 13th of December to the 31st of December, let's black America out. Uh -huh. Let's reverse the curse. Mm -hmm. Black out everything from the day of the march to watch night. Yeah. And then come to watch night to pray for yeah. God to change the heart of the oppressor. Come on, black out plane rides, black out buses, yeah. black out train rides, uh -huh. black out buying all these gifts, yeah. and use the time that you would buy all your gifts uh -huh. and sit down and mentor a son yeah. or a daughter or a niece or a nephew. Yeah. Sit down and tell them the whole story. Tell them about Christ. Don't go spend all your money all over. If you're going to spend your money, spend it with black businesses. Yeah. I know some of you are feeling that in your spirit, but you've been talking a lot of trash. Are you ready to walk it? Black out. Black out America. Black, black out every uh, store. Black out Walmart and Target. Black it out. Black out Sears and JC Penney's and Macy's. Black it out. But give your money to black businesses and those businesses who are struggling. Give your money there. Between the 13th and 31st, eat at home. Try to cook a meal once in a while. Come on. And I'm not trying to disrespect. I thank God for the women in our culture, our black women. Come on. You've done so much and carry so much weight. But in this war, you gotta let us lead a little bit. CP3 and the brothers of the NBA, not to just take a pledge for the NBA or, or your, like your commercials and we take a pledge for, for, for app allegiance. No, take a pledge for black allegiance. Tell them from the 13th to the 31st, I'm not going to bounce no ball, foul, no foul shots, and I'm not going to let no rep, I'm going to talk to no rep. Tell black coaches, Doc Rivers, Byron Scott, and the rest of them to shut the NBA, NBA down. And don't be saying, why you want to do that, Reverend? When they wanted more money, they shut the NBA down. Yeah. When they wanted better pictures, the more they did, they shut the, the, the NBA down. Now shut it down because there's blood in the streets. Shut it down for a black man that's dying, a black woman that's dying. Shut it down for all the people who are hurting. Shut it down to justice and to America. Tell Lil Wayne, tell Future, tell AC 
their faces. Don't be afraid of their whips and chains. Don't be afraid of their guns and their tanks. Raise up black people. You are made in the image of God. You are not three fish. You're much more than that. Raise up black men. We need you to come home and take care of your children. We need you to come home and take care of our women. Raise up black men. Don't be afraid. You've been trained in the army. You know how to handle business. We can't sit on the sidelines. We need to black out America on the 13th of December, the 31st, and let you know black lives matter. It matters to Jesus. That's why he died on the cross. And whether you believe it or not, he had a little tent like I got in his skin. And he got up with power in his hand. Why did he get up? He got up so the poor could have their day. He got up so the broken could have their day. He got up so the abused could have their day. He got up 